Hé. Hey. Ga je van je houden? Oh, dat, je... dat zijn mijn notes inderdaad. Dus, uh... Ik heb voor de sessie begonnen. Het is prima als ik hier nog even... Sorry? Oh, ja. Oké, okay, welcome back everybody. My name is uh, Willem Torp. I will be the session chair for the upcoming session, the second session of uh, this day. Manu uh, Bretel, here in front of me, will be the timekeeper. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you to uh, Renard and Sox for being uh, the host, and thanks for VeriSign for being the 2022 workshop patron. Uh, remember, we still have until the end of this session, so after the three talks and the start of the lunch, to submit lightning talks, if you want to present at a very last slot. Um, after uh, this session, uh, we will have the lunch break, one and a half hour lunch break, and there will be a uh, Women at Org uh, table. Uh, in the lunch room, which uh, is a long table in front of the two round pillars in the restaurant. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to present the uh, first speaker of today, which is uh, Jeroen Bilton. And Jeroen is, going to, is from the SIDN, the, the people that do .nl, and he is going to present on one-click name server deploy. Jeroen, for is yours. Thank you, Willem. So, uh, yeah, as uh, Willem said, I work for the Dutch registry. Um, I must say, I uh, was uh, put on the spot by one of my colleagues who said, um, I can't go to the, uh, to the DNS OARC conference, so maybe you could do a presentation on what we built uh, uh, the last uh, six months. And I naively said, uh, okay, I'll do that. But uh, I must say, um, um, yeah, um, I'll just move on to the agenda for the, for, for the presentation. So it's quite straightforward, actually. Um, I'll uh, present some uh, intro and background. I'll tell something about the goals that we had before starting this project. The challenges that we faced, uh, the accomplishments that we, uh, that we made, and um, some uh, future developments. So this is uh, what I thought uh, was the obligatory slide about uh, introducing myself. I used to go to conferences uh, on system engineering, network engineering, where there's always an, a slide about the presenter, but I uh, noticed that nobody does that on, uh, on, uh, this, um, on this conference, so I'll keep it short. Just suffice to say, uh, I've been a network engineer and system engineer, um, now part of a dedicated uh, DNS team for SIDN. And over on the right, you can see me in a typical situation where I uh, try to explain the problem is not in the network. Uh, but I, uh, I love engineering. I love an engineering um, uh, challenge. So um, I'd like to take you back about five years in the past uh, where we operated our uh, own um, DNS uh, infrastructure, which was not anycasted, so it was uh, still unicast. 
um, with a focus on the uh, on the uh, on the uh, Netherlands uh, area. Um, and uh, there were there were a few uh, challenges uh, uh, operating that. Um, uh, the most important of which was uh, DDoS attacks. Uh, obviously, we had a couple of uh, very large scale DDoS attacks um, uh, in succession within a short uh, period of time. And uh, we only uh, partly managed to um, to circumvent uh, these uh, these attacks, partly because the um, the legitimate traffic was uh, very hard to distinguish from the uh, from the attack uh, traffic. Um, so, uh, well, uh, the, 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 we had uh, uh, very limited uh, resources, both in, in time and money, to uh, to set up a uh, global anycast infrastructure within a short per uh, per period of time. So we um, decided to move to third-party Anycast services uh, for uh, for publishing the uh, NL zone. Another thing that we uh, that we noticed, however, was that um, about 60% um, of all queries on .NL seem to originate from North America. Uh, we do continual uh, research on uh, on uh, uh, the the query patterns on on .NL. That's uh, the uh, SRDN Labs uh, uh, department is uh, mainly uh, focused on that. And um, uh, all the queries are uh, matched against a GeoIP uh, database. So uh, as soon as uh, an IP address seems to belong to uh, one of the big five mainly, so Google, Facebook, um, Amazon, etc. Uh, the GeoIP database says uh, North America. That doesn't have to be true, obviously, but the important thing to note here is that the, uh, the majority of the queries didn't seem to originate from the uh, provider networks within the Netherlands. So uh, there are basically two, two providers left uh, in, in the Netherlands, which uh, accounts for about 90% of all consumers, I think. Uh, it's KPN and, uh, and what is now called Ziggo, formerly UPC. So the majority of the queries on .nl didn't seem to originate from these networks, and that was a, an important uh, discovery for us. So a um, few years later, we decided uh, two things. We uh, needed to build a dedicated uh, DNS team, and we wanted to, uh, to um, uh, get uh, back at the helm to operate uh, ns1.dns.nl um, ourselves. So uh, we wanted to um, build a global uh, uh, DNS Anycast uh, infrastructure, be able to scale out quickly, uh, both uh, virtual and physical. Um, and an uh, important uh, uh, thing that we soon discovered, we have to stand on the shoulders of giants. So uh, if you're a team of only four people and you have to build a global DNS Anycast infrastructure fast, um, you uh, can do anything, uh, everything yourself, so you have to use uh, solutions offered by other, uh, by other parties. And another thing that was uh, um, uh, decided beforehand is that we had to uh, use metrics to improve the availability and latency of the platform, uh, so it, it, it was to be data-driven, that was a, an important um, thing. So uh, challenges, yeah, both technical and organizational, really. Um, we had set up a team, and uh, we decided to do a CICD, but the team was actually uh, largely new to CICD in the sense that everyone knows about CICD, obviously. If you're working in IT and you haven't heard about CICD, I think you're doing something wrong, perhaps. But uh, actually doing CICD uh, uh, presented us with a few challenges that we hadn't anticipated uh, beforehand. On the other hand, uh, Scrum suddenly made sense because our activities uh, looked a, lo a lot more like uh, development uh, instead of uh, system engineering. So, um, yeah, we made uh, small increments and uh, were uh, able to uh, obtain uh, early feedback from our uh, stakeholders. Moving on. Um, so, um, we decided to... Uh, 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 <coughs> DevOps, more specifically GitOps. So we wanted to um, have uh, uh, the coding Git uh, to be a true representation of the service in production, um, which means uh, all changes are, are versioned. You have an audit trail. Um, and we wanted to build um, a, a single artifact, so a golden image to be, de to de to be deployed, either virtually or physically. Um, with the ability to move forward and backward if uh, any problems should arise in a, in a release that you just, uh, just deployed. 
and uh, to uh, enforce uh, conflict uh, synchronization between all the, all the nodes deployed in the field, we uh, decided to periodically redeploy uh, any server um, uh, which had been running for more than, uh, more than two weeks. So this is uh, really the uh, cat will not pets approach, right? I mean, um, yeah, you, you deploy a server and it's, it's running for, uh, for, an, uh, for a, a number, of, number of days, number of weeks uh, perhaps, and uh, as soon as a new version of your image um, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is built, uh, you redeploy it and you simply decommission the old, uh, the old server. So, uh, as I said, a single act, uh, artifact deploy. Um, uh, yeah, I have to admit, uh, DNS is an almost perfect uh, application to, uh, to achieve this because, um, yeah, it's, it's almost state stateless, really. All you need is a zone file. And you have to uh, be able to remove uh, your uh, PCAP and metrics data uh, as soon as possible, so they are not lost when the when the server is uh, is uh, suddenly um, uh, unavailable. But apart from that, um, yeah, uh, you can just deploy DNS, and you have to do updates, uh, zone updates, of course. But apart from that, it's almost uh, stateless. And so that also means that uh, after deployment, there is really very little need for config for configuration management. You don't have to install additional packages. You don't have to do any user management because it's done centrally. So, um, yeah. So this is what our basic image building pipeline uh, looks like. Um, may come as a surprise for some of you that we are using Docker to build the, uh, the image, but uh, that has a uh, few important um, uh, uh, advantages uh, for us. We build the uh, image in uh, three stages uh, in the, in the Leftmost uh, stage, uh, a basic uh, Ubuntu uh, Linux image is uh, is uh, retrieved from the internet and built as a Docker image. Uh, a security scan is done over this image and it is uh, stored in the artifact uh, repository. In the second phase, um, some SIDN specific configuration is added to this image. Again, a security scan is done and it's again stored in the artifact repository. And in the last stage, the BGP and DNS uh, applications and configuration is added. Another uh, security scan is done. And then the image is flattened to a single TARG GZ, and it is stored in, uh, in a, uh, a blob in the cloud uh, to be uh, uh, deployed um, um, uh, on the World Wide Web, really, um, or in the, on the internet more specifically. Um, in the beginning of the, of the project, we were uh, building images um, maybe 30, 40 per day because, uh, yeah, very, very fast configuration changes. So we had to find a way to store these images very, um, very efficiently without uh, much overhead and without each image uh, taking up uh, too much, uh, too much uh, storage sp uh, space on the artifact uh, repository. So if you're using Docker, um, yeah, every layer that, is, that isn't changed uh, isn't uh, restored on the, uh, on the artifact repository, so that was a very uh, easy way to, um, to store the images. Uh, in addition, we uh, thought we would be able to, to spin up the images um, in the intermediate stages to do some testing. This is mainly done uh, for security purposes uh, now, but we also intend to add some functional, functional tests uh, later on. So this is what the one-click deployment on uh, Bare Metal as a Service uh, really looks like. Um, this is uh, me uh, deploying to a server in, uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, as you can see, the total duration of the deployment was about uh, nine minutes, just under 10 minutes, which includes uh, spinning up a physical server, uh, putting an image on it, booting it, um, uh, retrieving a zone file, doing some tests, uh, and enabling BGP. So, um, yeah. Uh, less than 10 minutes from, uh, from the click to, uh, to running a server uh, online. Um, yeah, this is one of the, so uh, obviously we're using Equinix, uh, the, the, the logo is included on screen, um, and Equinix has a very nice uh, API for deploying uh, images uh, on bare metal. Um, but they, um, yeah, they, they, they offer a, a number of uh, Linux distributions and even Windows and ESX uh, to, be de to be deployed uh, through their API. 
And you can also deploy your own image if you want, but if you do that, you're more or less on your own. You can provide an IPXC URL to point to a server under your control, but after that, you have to write your own code to actually retrieve the image and put it on the, put it on the server. So that was uh, the first challenge that we, uh, that we faced and that we successfully uh, uh, achieved. Um, so uh, we wrote some code to uh, retrieve an image from an Azure storage blob and um, deploy it on a, on a bare metal uh, server. I might add that the images that are stored in the, in the Azure uh, uh, blob are completely uh, devoid of any secrets. There are not, not any secrets or um, other... Uh, so uh, the, the storage is protected, but even if an image should um, um, become public, there's still nothing, uh, nothing uh, important uh, lost. Uh, so uh, we had to... Um, that was the second challenge that we faced. We had to localize the image after deployment. So. Uh, Equinix uses a uh, cloud in it to deploy uh, services, uh, servers, and we had to um, uh, provide information through cloud in it for the server to be able to know um, uh, uh, what secrets to use to connect to monitoring, to uh, retrieve the zone files, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the next uh, stage, building a platform. Um, obviously, yeah, the name servers have to do some kind of service discovery because they have to know where to get their zone files, uh, where to uh, push their metrics and logging uh, to, where to push their uh, um, uh, PCAP data to, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we um, made use of a, a little package uh, uh, made by HashiCorp, which is um, part of the HashiCorp stack, part of console, I think. It's called Surf. It's a bit, very basic service discovery uh, proxy, and it allows the name servers to uh, discover the so-called metrics nodes where they can retrie retrieve their own files and, uh, and push their uh, PCAP data to. So, in summary, uh, I've, I've said, this, said this before, but uh, what we automated was uh, uh, building and testing a custom inch, image as a single artifact, deploying this image on bare metal as a service, doing some pre-flight checks, so if the zone file is complete, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, enabling BGP, doing the zone transfers, uh, monitoring metrics and data collection, and also the CI/CD pipeline itself is built from code because uh, in the beginning of the project we had to. Um, be able to build on the image and on the uh, image generating pipeline at the same time. So we had a co copy of the pipeline and able to do that at the same uh, time. And as a bonus, we became best friends with our auditor because, um, yeah, the, the, the word that I've uh, uh, obviously circumvented is uh, immutable infrastructure, but we're trying to achieve that. Um, the uh, the uh, image that is running in production should be a true rep representation of the... Uh, of the um, of the code that is, uh, that is in Git. So after our deployment, nothing is uh, changed and every change is accounted for uh, through the, uh, the Git log, uh, basically. The target platform architect architecture looks like this then. In the middle, you can see the Anycast cloud uh, operated behind AS4283. Over on the right, you can see AS1140, where the zone generation and uh, uh, registration of, uh, of records is still taking place. And we're using a, a SaaS a solution for a monitoring and alerting and metrics, which is basically hosted uh, ELK. Future development. So um, we want to optimize uh, PCAP processing because now the complete uh, PCAP uh, files are pushed uh, to a central uh, 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 over uh, to uh, 11, uh, 1140 uh, on, on the right. So it's a very uh, large strain on our uh, external uh, internet uh, connection because these PCAP files can get uh, rather, rather, rather big. So we want to optimize uh, that. Reevaluate our tool chain. Uh, we wanted to first have a complete pipeline and then reevaluate uh, uh, the tools that we use. Um, and uh, we're considering uh, uh, putting um, uh, Terraform uh, in between for, uh, for deployment to, uh, to, to optimize uh, some other de deployment strategies. Uh, to improve deployment concurrency also because there are some, some things that cannot uh, run at the same time at this moment. We also want to add some more tests and uh, add some more metrics to optimize the platform because what we're really trying to achieve here is um, yeah, scenario-based testing, right? I mean, we're uh, deploying servers worldwide, see what it does for latency and catchment, and if it's um, um, 
uh, not opt and optimal in the sense that uh, the, the latency is, uh, is, uh, is too big, then we can simply uh, turn, uh, turn the server off and deploy a server on a different location and see what that does. And uh, once we're comfortable running the platform, uh, we've been running the platform now for, um, I think, close to six months, as ns1.dns.nl. Once we're comfortable uh, running this server, we want to provide uh, our Anycast servers uh, to, uh, to other TLDs. So uh, that, is, uh, that is the plan. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you for all for listening, and uh, I'd like to invite any questions from the, from the public. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jeroen. Alexander, you can go. Alexander Mayhofer, Nikto.at. Uh, I have two questions about the details of your image building and deployment. The first is, can you elaborate a little bit of what you're doing with regards to security scan? Is that Trivi or something else of those tools? Yeah, we're, we're scanning tools? the image uh, using it, both Trivi and Gripe. Gripe is okay. another tool for, uh, okay. for scanning. Yeah. Uh, and the other question is, are you for secrets management? What's your tool of the choice there? Is it HashiCorp Sorry, Vault? Cut quite, quite for bit. secrets management, is it HashiCorp Vault or are you using any other thing? When no, you, uh, um, how, do the, how do the secrets actually get into the deployed image? Uh, yeah? At this moment, the, secret, uh, the secrets are uh, all um, uh, stored within the pipeline itself, not, not in Git, obviously, because uh, yeah, then they're basically public, but uh, in the pipeline itself, and they're um, uh, uh, provided to the booting image, as I said before, uh, through cloud init, and then they're uh, added to the configuration of all the necessary uh, daemons to, uh, yeah, okay. to be able to run. But we're, uh, that was an, an all, uh, also another uh, tool uh, selection that we, um, that we considered. We want, we want to include Vault in yeah. the platform, another HashiCorp um, um, yeah. Uh, service, uh, yeah. which is uh, uh, very easy for uh, for secrets management. Yeah, yeah. Sounds, sounds very similar to the work that we are doing, so we could uh, have a beer together and, and look at what, where we can optimize here. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Okay, there are no uh, online questions yet. Oh, there's one. Yes. Uh, let me repeat this. So this is a question from our uh, story. Did you test performance of Docker services versus uh, bare metal? Um, maybe uh, this wasn't completely clear from my presentation, but we're not deploying Docker images on the bare metal um, on the bare metal server. So uh, at the end of the Docker build stages, we flatten this image to a, to a single tar -G tar -GZ. And in the boot process, this tar -GZ is ex uh, expanded onto the file system of the uh, of the booting server, and then it's basically just a KXEC to uh, to boot the sort of the server is not rebooting after after deployment. It's simply a KXEC of the kernel that was installed onto the file system. Um, sure. I have read some uh, documentation about um, uh, performance of uh, DNS uh, uh, as a Docker container uh, uh, as, um, compared to uh, literally on bare metal uh, servers, and uh, there was a, a very little performance hit uh, apparently. So uh, yeah, we may consider um, actually deploying Docker images instead of directly to bare metal, but that would mean it is a two-stage deployment, so that would complicate things. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I have one more to uh, maybe fill the gap, or it's not, m not so much a question, but much uh, uh, a mentioning of a thing we discussed uh, earlier uh, this, uh, during the org, is that you're currently using um, or you want a BGP announcement to your name service to be uh, activated or uh, uh, triggered when all the zones are loaded, yeah. right? And you have a special mechanism uh, for this, uh, which is implemented in the not resolver uh, yeah. by using Dbus. And, and I thought it might be interesting if this uh, mechanism would be standardized and could be used on all the different uh, open source authoritative name servers. Yeah, I would also so, like uh, to extend our gratitude, by the way, to the people over at uh, CZNIC because.
because yeah. they, uh, at, at our request, they um, they added this debug debug event uh, functionality into the into the, the, the not uh, daemon. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we we um, uh, as I said, uh, as soon as the image is uh, is, is booted, uh, a lot of a lot of things have to happen in a, in a certain uh, uh, succession. Yes. Um, and the event-based uh, approach that we can do uh, with, our, with the Dbus event uh, was a very great, uh, very great help. Yeah. So I see uh, two more questions in the MetaMouse channel. Uh, first is uh, Peter Mensik. Have you considered Podman instead of Docker? Yes, we have. <laughs> and we're still considering it okay. because, uh, yeah, apparently Docker is using, uh, it's losing some momentum. Uh, I might say, I, I think even uh, Kubernetes dropped support for uh, for Docker. Um, so, um, yeah, we're still considering uh, using Podman because uh, basically the Podman command should be uh, a drop-in replacement for the Docker command. You, sh you should be able to do everything that uh, Docker also uh, is able to do. Okay, then I have a question from a uh, data owl. Uh, he says, I'm very interested in your choice that lead to using Surf on its own, which seems to be way less common in the industry, contrary to using console. You mentioned thinking about Vault that works very well with console. Yeah, yeah as soon as we um, include Vault into the platform, platform we will also uh, probably uh, use console instead of surf, but um, yeah, we wanted to take a, a very um, uh, minimalistic approach to um, re uh, realizing this platform and using the the tool that was able to do what we needed at that moment instead of trying to include tools that can do everything and add a lot of complexity that we weren't able to manage at that uh, point in the development process. So yeah. Thank you, Jeroen. Okay. Uh, our ne next speaker is uh, Benno Overeiner, which is, he is from NLNet Labs, but he is now speaking uh, with his uh, DNSOP uh, working group chair hat on, more or less. <laughs> and uh, so he, he will talk about uh, everything that's happening uh, at the IITF in the, uh, on, on DNS, and his talk is called Keeping Up with the DNS in the IITF. Oh, and don't forget that uh, the poll will appear in the uh, MetaMouse channel and it's very important uh, for the program committee that you uh, uh, give a thumbs or give your opinion on the poll and uh, so we can judge uh, or look uh, what, what works well at the conference. Thanks. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Willem. Uh, yeah, Benno Hoofreiner, co-chair of DNSOP, but I have to make some caveat. This is a personal kind of, uh, well, it's a presentation done by me, not by the DNS co-chairs, so to say. I have to make some caveats here. Now, I made a selection I think is interesting for this audience. But there's much more other work uh, that's also relevant, and I won't present. So that's, it's not, I, have, I want to make that clear. Is, and the, I wanted to say that anyway, uh, Willem, <laughs> because I think it's important. There's much, much more work to, uh, ongoing in the, in the DNSOP working group. So this is indeed the DNS in the ITF, not only DNSOP. So this is the DNS universe, in the ITF, and again, that's my interpretation. Uh, currently, we have, counting well, five DNS-related working groups, but there's much more work in uh, DNS work going on in the, in the ITF. Um, IoT working groups are using, thinking of a special way of using DNS in their, uh, in their well, drafts or RFCs to be. Um, and that was also kind of recognized also by the area director and the DNS op co-chairs and the other DNS uh, working group chairs. So there's now a DNS directorate. So that helps us, the DNS related working groups, to identify new drafts, to discuss them, review them, early review, give feedback to the relevant working groups. 
that said, going to the real work here. So I kind of made a selection of almost finished work or finished work and ongoing work. So this is a recent ROC, the NSEC3 parameters uh, settings or the guidance. It has been also discussed recently uh, at the center meeting. Some operators are, so not everyone here at the OARC, were also attending the, the center meeting. But the CCTLDs in Europe uh, have a center meeting in the morning, uh, yesterday morning. And many of the CCTLDs are moving to the new recommended values for NSEC3. And that's NSEC iteration count of one, which is actually one hash iteration for the NSEC3. And not to use salt, uh, indicated with a length zero. And there are all kinds of reasons why you shouldn't do that or it doesn't have additional security. It doesn't give you additional security or privacy or protecting the data. Uh, and it can create extra work if you have a large uh, NSEC3 iteration count. So these, uh, this work is done as RFC, and uh, it's good to see that uh, the different operators, zone operators, are picking up this RFC and change their settings. Other work, uh, it's not an RFC yet, but it's the working group last call just finished with not much, uh, well, there was feedback, but not complicated feedback. So this, after the working group last call, there has been a new revision submitted, and it will be sent to the ISG for publication. So that's, thanks. And DNS catalog zones also probably, it, I think it has been presented earlier also at the OARC, not sure. Yeah, I think so, yeah. But it's, it's, it's a way for provisioning zones. So, so creating, a new, well, with primary and secondaries, you have to, well, traditionally, update both servers if you introduce a new zone or you want to relieve uh, Sorry, delete a zone from the, from the set of zones you serve. And with uh, catalog zones, you can do everything at the primary. Uh, and by a regular zone transfer, the catalog zone is sent to the uh, Freien IXVR, IXVR, to the secondaries, and the zones can be deleted or provisioned. So that's, that's a very uh, well, useful extension to the DNS family of protocols. Family. And also, I hear many people asking for this feature. It's currently implemented by PowerDNS and uh, proof of concept implementations with other open source developers. I'm looking at Ray actually. It's, the bind is also already there. So there's all, or, and there was already an other implementation by bind, by Catalog Sounds. So it's, it's really helpful for the community. Yeah. Yeah, bind has had an implementation of the original spec for Catalog Zones yeah. for a good few years now. Uh, I can't say what the status of the new spec is. But. Right, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for additional information. Yeah. Okay. So almost all the yeah. Thank you, William. So all the <laughs> open source developers have implemented the new catalog zones, and uh, and Elder Labs has a proof of concept, but not uh, in production. Yeah. Thanks. Good. Um, what? How do we? What's time doing? Doing well? Yeah, five minutes still before q and I'll have to speed up a bit. Uh, other things. Well, uh, this has certainly been presented. Uh, SVCB, HTTPS uh, work in the DNS op. So two main features of this draft is that it specifies uh, how you can contact a service, which protocol, and also which protocol parameters improve privacy and security of offering this service, and it also s gives a solution for a long-standing problem, aliasing of Apex domains. Uh, um, there has been a lot, it's already quite long in working group last call, there has been some substantial, well, there has been some issues raised during the period, uh, has been addressed with a new revision submitted this month, if I'm correct, uh, recent, past week, last week. Uh, and yeah, it's it uh, ISG now for well final approval and publication. Fragment avoidance in DNS also has been properly presented here. It's also a working group last call, but there was substantial feedback. Um, the fragmentation avoidance there has been a DNS flag day by the open source developers with some advice. 
and uh, the, 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 the software has been, well, configured to have a maximum, or some, some recommended maximum uh, packet size. Jeff Houston also did a lot of measurements on packment fragmentation, and there was some advice in other RFCs. So this document discusses these three different recommendations and the trade-offs, but the implementers want to have more clear language because when reading it, it's a good summary, but when reading it, they want to more, have more direction how to implement it or whether it reflects the current implementation. Uh, a new revision has been submitted. Going forward, uh, speeding up a bit, DNSSEC automation has been also presented. Uh, it's in close to working group last call. It's interesting, it's, it builds on, up, on top of another RFC where you can have multiple providers signing your zone with different key management. So, but you can also use the same model actually to go from one provider to another provider without going insecure. That's nice. Uh, DNSSEC bootstrapping is also close to working, uh, sorry, working group last call. It gives you, thanks, it gives you a means to um, introduce a new zone uh, with the DNS key material in an automated way um, by signaling via an already signed zone the CDS key material or CDS CDS key material. Good. Um, I want to mention this because I also different conversations last uh, over the past days during lunch and uh, lunch is DNS error reporting. We mentioned also. Um, Extended DNS errors. So, why do I get a server fail? Is that because of, well, uh, bogus, for example, or signature expired, etc.? So, this is DNS extended error. Uh, and now, as an authoritative, I might want to be actively informed if things go wrong, if the validators see a problem. Uh, and with these extended DNS errors, you can, well, the DNS error reporting builds on top of that and advertise as well. If you find an error, validation error, you can send it to this error reporting agent. And then as an authoritative name server, I'm actively involved, uh, in informed there are problems with my zone, etc. And that's good, that's good. Interesting. Okay, I promised Tim, one of the Deprive co-chairs, to say something about Deprive work. And that's, well, this is good news. DNS over Quick has been published. Uh, we've seen also in the previous uh, OART meeting, there are some implementations, some early measurements, that's good. So not resolver and not DNS for sure. And Edgard people have, did present work. So that's ongoing work and other implementers are also working on this. Existing work and that I think is also important for DNS over quick and DNS over TLS is kind of the signaling that the authoritative does support something like DNS over quick in DOT. Um, there was a lot of discussion about this signaling of uh, DOT or DOQ. Uh, and there were three other proposals, drafts that didn't make it. Well, there was not enough interest or different opinions about the draft. And the current authors of this draft said, well, at least make it, this is kind of a bare minimum we can provide to make some step in the right direction. It, I phrase it quite carefully, but it's kind of an opportunistic way. The, way. the moment as a resolver, I do a DNS over port 53 regular, and in parallel, I also try a DNS over quick or DNS over TLS query to the same authoritative. And if I learn that one of these DOT, DOQ protocols are also supported, I remember I cast this result. And with next uh, queries, uh, the resolver can use DOQ or DOT. That's a short version. Um, I stop here. Are there any questions or comments? I, I'd I wanted actually to start to ask who's following the DNS uh, mailing list, DNS or mailing list before. Because yeah, most of you that are already following the mailing list, this is nothing new, but. Uh, <laughs> not every thread. Not, not every thread, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So it's, yeah, so I hope this triggers some discussion or some interest in you in that some of these specific uh, RFCs or drafts being presented, or I just presented. There's other work also going on, but 
for this venue, I, I made this selection. So blame me for this uh, presentation and not being complete. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, yeah, there's a lot going on in the ITF. David Lawrence, Salesforce, uh, ADD co-chair. Yeah. Um, we work closely with the NSOP and Deprive, and also yeah. the reason I got up to the microphone was to point out that since many different RFCs in other areas that are not even in the DNS working groups often specify things related to the yeah. DNS, that uh, Eric Vink has started the DNS directorate, of yeah. which uh, Jeff Houston here is co-chair, yeah. and um, so uh, much like the other directorates in the ITF, this reviews all RFCs for their DNS relevance and, and yeah. applicability. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's it's indeed very important. I'm happy uh, Eric Finke took the initiative to do that. Yeah. There's an online question I can answer myself even. <laughs> Peter Mensik, does Unbound is Unbound going to support uh, DNS over quick soon? Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's the, uh, you can already find the the, the feature branch in our. GitHub public repo. We already re received also some feedback from early testers. Uh, people were interested in the, in the implementation. Yeah. So please, uh, Peter Mensek, uh, yeah, give it a try. Can, you can try it out. Yes. Yeah. 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 And for the, I also promised Tim. Oh, okay. Here. So also for the unilateral uh, opportunistic deployment, uh, the probing. We need implementation, so this PowerDNS currently does have an implementation, but for this work to finish, to become an RFC, uh, there's a call of the DNS, of the Deprive chairs to have more implementations. So it's, uh, so it's us, and he wants us not to sit in front of him because he will use the whip. Yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we work on it, yeah. Um, Alex, may I offer a short comment on that? Um, yeah. our, our colleagues from the university are thinking about doing an um, opportunistic experiment on one of the authoritative .at name servers. So we All might right. have some kind of experience with a TLD level name server. Nice, so yeah. So, and speaking now as um, an LNET lab person <laughs> or an open source developer, I think oh, I should no, no. cut off. Yeah, this is last thing. As, as an open source developer, I think we should coordinate this. With the other and and thank you, Alex, uh, for for providing then or testing or experimenting uh, from an authoritative part and uh, recursors, and we can do interrupt testing to some development uh, soon, and to uh, to make this uh, well, to make progress on this draft. I think it's important. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Benno. <laughs>
as said, they never really cared about it, just typed in yes and continued with the work. But if you do not do this check properly, malice in the middle attacks are possible. So that means an attacker could be in the middle of your SSH session and somehow steal those login credentials or maybe even compromise your SSH session. So this is an important thing to do and you should start doing it from now on. So how would you do it? On the left side, you see the manual process that probably most people would need to do. That is contacting your server's administrator to provide you the fingerprint. Then you get the string. You compare the string to the one that is, was shown to you in the shell. And then you can decide if those strings match and if you want to continue connecting or abort the connection. However, we humans are kind of bad when it comes to comparing strings and we do mistakes. So this is probably not the best way to do it. So there's also a DNS-based um, process which is written down in the SSH RFC. So the administrator could also publish those host key fingerprints in the DNS, hopefully using DNSSEC, and then your SSH client can do the check for you. So it removes you from the equation and provides more security benefits. So how does those SSH of P DNS records look like? So there are several RFCs. 4255 is the main one from 2006. So these records are not new. They have been around for quite a while. And there are some also some other RFCs that extend several fields and values. So what is the format? You have SSHFP, then the key algorithm, be one for RSA, three for ECDSA, four for ED25519, and then you have the hash type, so the hashing algorithm of the fingerprint, which is one for SHA-1 and two for SHA-256, mm -hmm. and then you have the fingerprint as in, in the hexadecimal representation. So how does that look like? I hope you can read that on Zoom as well. I try to resize those um, figures. So opendev.org does everything correctly, so I use them as an example. However, I'm not affiliated with them whatsoever. So you can use, or you can just query for SSHFP and yeah, get the uh, resource records of their domain. So we can see they have three different um, key types, which is RSA, which is one, three, which was um, EC DSA, and four, which was ED25519. And for all three types, they have both hashing algorithms used. So you see one and two. And then you have the hexadecimal fingerprints. So if you would like to set, up, set that up for your own server, you can easily generate those fingerprints records um, using SSH-keyscan-D and it will print them out so you can just copy and paste them to your configuration, which is pretty nice. So once you did that, um, and you would like to use or instruct SSH to use those records to verify the connection, you have to provide the dash O verify Hosky DNS either yes or ask option. So if you use the or increase the verbosity, you will see in the debug output that the SSH client um, queries those records. In our case, with opendev.org, they found all the six secure fingerprints in the DNS, does a comparison, and then continues with the connection, which is also pretty nice because you do not have to interact with your shell anymore. It just does everything in the background. So I was wondering, well, um, is this record type used? Um, yeah, how distributed is it? And I did an analysis of the Trenko 1 million list, which claims to be to have domains which are security um, yeah, oriented and hardened. So of those 1 million domains, 105 use SSHFP records. Then we queried the A records for all those domains to find SSH servers. So we found 75 of them. Then we compared the DNS fingerprints that we obtained with the server side fingerprints that the servers provided and tried to match them. So we found 66 um, matching sets with at least one matching fingerprint. 
And then we try to verify if those DNS records are securely transferred. So only 28 use DNS tag. So we thought, okay, that's not that much, so maybe we should do a more in the wild analysis. So we use the certificate and transparency logs to obtain DNS domains. Um, so over the course of 26 days, and then we had 500 million. We scanned them, we, in the end, we ended up with 70,672 SSHFP record sets because some domains appeared multiple times. Then again, we scanned for A records and their SSH servers, of which we had 16,300. Compared both data sets again, had a rough, roughly 14,500 matches, and then we checked for DNS again, and in the end, we only end up with 3,800 unique domains that use DNS. So, in all cases, yeah, the usage is quite rare, it's not that common. So, another thing that we noticed is that the setup only works flawlessly if the set of DNS-based fingerprint and the fingerprint provided by the servers are identical. Because if not, there will be um, certain fingerprints that the client won't be able to verify. So the client de decides which key algorithm to use and which hashing algorithm to use. And if the client doesn't find a matching fingerprint in the DNS, then we are back to the manual process which we do not want. So we can see that for the Tranco 1 million list, only 48% yeah, at 100% overlapping rate, and for the trans certificate transparency log, the number was even less. So we only had uh, roughly 24% that had 100% matching rate. So there's still room for improvement. So if you look at the data from a security perspective, you'll find that only less than 50% of the domains and the records that we analyzed were DNSSEC secured. And in my opinion, while this is great, I would say that at least some people use DNSSEC, it's still not good enough because if you transfer those records unsecured, then the malice in the middle attack will not happen at the SSH level, but on the DNS level and then you haven't gained any security benefits at all. So let's get to the conclusion of my short talk here. So very few people use SSHFP DNS records, although in my opinion it is quite easy to set up and use. Of those people that use it, um, from the numbers and data that we observed, less than 50% use DNSSEC, which again, kind of defeats the purpose of using those SSHFP records in the first place to increase the security. So maybe we can all somehow try to make SSHFP records more popular and even DNSSEC more popular because, yeah, in my opinion, this is a neat solution to a problem that many of us have. And with that, we can come to the questions. Oh yeah, one more thing. So. Niels and I wrote a paper on that research. So if you Google for um, OSSH it, what's my fingerprint, you will probably find the paper which will be published at Cannes uh, next month. And the code and data is also available. So feel free to have a look. Thank you. So are there any questions for Sebastian? Remote people post them in the MetaMask channel. No? Yeah, Till. So hi, uh, uh, Tail Salesforce. Um, actually relaying a comment that someone else made in the matter most. Uh, one thing to note, OpenSSH apparently changed their implementation in 8.7 so that all SSHFP in the DNS much mass, must match the host key, not just at least one. It breaks SSHFP validation for multiple servers sharing a common service host name and also makes it impossible to seamlessly roll host key as the DNS update would have to happen exactly at the same time. Do you know anything about this? And do you have any maybe contact with OpenSSH developers to indicate you know, that this is an operational problem for a lot of people? 
Um, I had not have any contact with OpenSSH developers. Um, yeah, so thanks for the comment. Um, yeah, what I'm going actually to say about it. Um, yeah, so the matching rate is just from our data. So um, it could be that there are other requirements that um, we have not yet checked. So yeah, I will have another look into it. Thanks. No more questions? One, two. All right, Thank enjoy you, the lunch. <laughs>Yes, indeed. So uh, thank you, Sebastian, Benno, and uh, Jeroen for speaking in this session. Also, uh, thank you, uh, Runit and Sox, for hosting uh, this uh, 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 workshop. And for uh, thank you, Center, for being a uh, joint uh, program partner. And thank you, Verizon, for being the uh, 2022 workshop patron. Uh, so we will have the lunch break now for. Uh, 85 minutes. It will start. We will restart the third session five minutes before two o'clock uh, local time. So not two o'clock, but five minutes before that. Uh, that's 11:55 UTC, by the way. Uh, during lunch, there will be the uh, women at uh, org table, which is marked. Uh, partners and such are also welcome, which are not women there. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's it. See you back uh, at session three at uh, five before two. Thank you. <laughs>